Uh, I was provoked last week by uh, the practice him Sister Debbie had chosen, the hem of his garment. And um, I'm going to recontinue uh, the postings and the studies I've been doing in salvation seen in the miracles of Christ. Um, the reason why this provokes me is because the hem of his garment um, actually lines up with the next miracle that was set up in the schedule that I had already listed out for myself. And this one was like, I really need to get back to doing this. So thank you, Sister Debbie, for, uh, for doing that. Um, this evening we're going to look at actually the two miracles that go at that time. Um, that's the healing of Jairus' daughter and the woman with the issue of blood. And it's entirely possible for Christ to save the souls of more than two people at a time. And he can save one who is in the throes of death as easily as he can save the one who is in the slew of despondency. And he can do both at the same time. One of the interesting aspects of these miracles is in the way they are spoken of in scripture, as though it is actually one miracle. We have a testament that starts off with Jairus, it segues into the woman with the issue of blood, and it segues seamlessly in, back into Jairus and his daughter. And that's the manner of salvation. Many are being saved through different circumstances, but to use the phrase from George Young's hymn, God leads us along, but all through the blood. It doesn't matter what the situation is or how many situations occur at the same time. Jesus is the only way to access salvation. Mm -hmm. to, start, we'll, we'll, to start off with, we'll look at the issue or the woman with the issue of blood. Now, the obvious thing is her issue was her blood. Uh, read several commentaries and they talk about what the blood issue could have possibly been. Uh, many commentaries talk about being healed from the issue of blood, but they gloss over the obvious correlation to salvation that her issue was with her blood. She is in the lineage of Adam and would not have been able to initiate her own salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 and 47 makes that distinction between the first man Adam and the last Adam or the second man. The first man Adam was made a living soul and was earthy, whereas the last Adam was made a quickening spirit and as the Lord of heaven. She had to be fundamentally changed in order to be made righteous and to be able to put on the new man. And these types of issues cannot be resolved with human psychology, nor can it be resolved with, the, with um, a bunch of the best of man's medical expertise. Brother Matt did an excellent job expounding this this morning in his, in his sermon. Now the issue of sin is rooted deep in mankind. It's not like a strand of DNA that we can look at and say, oh look, there it is, let's just pluck that out of that DNA strand and everything will be perfect. It's something that must be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Second, Jesus perceived virtue had left him the very moment the woman touched the hem of his garment. John 14, 6 says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. To think that one could enter into salvation without his knowledge is very ignorant. At the wedding feast, the master of the feast quickly notices which guests were not invited and they are promptly tossed out. The Lord provides the wedding attire for you and he admits you to the feast. Similarly, the touching of just the hem of his garment is enough to make you whole and will provide you with what you need to enter into the feast. This does not mean that once you've touched his hem, you are free from commitment. Because as you can see in the ceiling, which is the next point, which is upon revealing herself, she immediately gave credit to Jesus. Salvation does not cause a person to be apathetic, nor does it cause a person to resist revealing what Jesus has done. Any believer who has recognized that something is from the Lord will desire to be quick and willing to testify to the goodness of the Lord. She knew that trying to hide the power of Christ was foolish, and even more foolish to try to hide it from Christ himself. He is going to receive glory and honor for what he has done and for what he is yet to do. And then we segue into Jairus and his daughter. Now while Jesus spoke to the woman with the issue of blood, he was also attentive to the news from Jairus' home. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, Jesus is not restricted to the administration of salvation at, uh, one person at a time. Could you imagine how long it would take if that was the way that he worked? So I'm going to devote all my time and attention and resource to Brother Given. Okay, I'm going to work with him until he is clear in salvation. Once he's got grasp in it, I'm going, to, I'm going to work with Brother Tony on it. Then once he's got grasp in it, I'll move on to someone else. That's not how he works in salvation. Yeah. Salvation can be ministered to many people and worked out by many people all at the same time. While he is saving one, he can hear the call of those around him. He can look at you and say, thy faith hath made you whole, then turn over here and said, be not afraid, just only believe. 
Next thing I want you to look at is that Jesus only allowed five people into Jairus' home. As in all his miracles, Jesus was not flashy or showy or attention-seeking. The healing of the woman with the issue of blood, he, he did not point her out in the crowd and said, I'm going to heal you. With, with uh, the healing of Jairus' daughter, he allowed only three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, to come in. Then also had Jairus and his wife allowed, were allowed in. Though many will claim to follow Jesus, few will enter into his rest. We also see that those who were not invited were the ones who actually laughed at Jesus in order to scorn him. The Father will not permit the scorners of Jesus to enter into salvation. <laughs> Lastly, Jesus commanded that she be given meat. In other notes I've written on salvation, uh, in the seen in the miracles, I've mentioned that entering into salvation is not a one-time act, but is actually a continual thing. This particular miracle, Jesus commands that the one who has just been saved be given some meat. Saul, after his conversion, if you remember, was given meat to eat so he could be strengthened. This meat wasn't just for the sake of eating, but as in the case of Saul, strength needed to be gained. Jairus' daughter had just been saved from death and needed to regain her strength. Similarly, when a person is saved from the dominion of sin, they need to be immediately built up and strengthened and edified. After being saved from sin, a mac and cheese meal is not going to cut it. The happy meal salvation is not going to be sufficient to building someone up. Amen. I'm not saying that discernment is to be thrown, out the, uh, thrown to the wind and just throw me at everybody. Because, I mean, there were some such as the Hebrews who could not receive spiritual meat yet. They need to go have spiritual milk. My point in this is that once you have been saved from the dominion of sin, Jesus is not just going to minister mac and cheese to you and say, that's good enough. Now, it's been a real, a real delight to see uh, salvation more clearly in studying these miracles, and it's really been a delight to me to see um, the miracles in a different way they've been typically been taught, and um, I hope that you've been edified with these as much as I have. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and uh, Sister Barb will lead us in our time of singing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your Son. We thank you for the salvation that he has administered to, to mankind, that he can, um, that he is, he's able to save all to the uttermost, and that he is able to save many people at one time, Lord. Lord, I pray that you continue to be with us in our meeting tonight, and cause us to be an edification to one another. Since we pray, amen.